Good morning, everyone. Let's start our time together with a prayer. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for a beautiful Sunday morning. And I ask that you draw near to us today and surround us with your love, that you'd comfort and strengthen us today by the power of your precious Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd work in a mighty way and change us from the inside out and make us more like Jesus Christ with each passing moment. I pray that you'd be with people who have lost loved ones this week. I pray especially for our North Carolina family that has lost their grandfather and their father. Lord, we pray that you'd be with them today. Be with those who have lost loved ones to uh, this virus, COVID-19, that still plagues us. And be with us in a special way. I pray that you'd give us courage, strength, and resilience to rise above the things that are plaguing us today. And Father, we pray that you would just conform us each passing moment to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Scripture I'm going to read to you this morning comes from Exodus 14, and it's 19 through 31. And this is the time when the children of Israel had been delivered from their captivity in Egypt, and they were traveling, but uh, it hadn't been very long, apparently, and um, the Pharaoh in Egypt decided he was going to go and get them back. And if he couldn't get them back, he was just going to wipe them out. And so he and his chariots and army were uh, in hot pursuit of them. And this is where we pick up the story. The angel of God, who had been in front of the army of Israel, moved and went to the rear. The pillar of cloud also moved and until it was between the Egyptians and the Israelites. The cloud made it dark for the Egyptians, but gave light to the people of Israel. So the armies couldn't come near each other at night. Moses held out his hand over the Red Sea, and the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind, and it blew all night, and it turned the sea into dry land. The water was divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with the walls of water on both sides. The Egyptians pursued them and went after them into the sea with all of their horses and chariots and drivers. Just before, just before dawn, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptians and their army and threw them into a panic. He made the wheels of their chariots get stuck so that they moved with great difficulty. The Egyptians said, The Lord is fighting for the Israelites against them. <laughs> Let's get out of here. And the Lord said to Moses, Hold out your hand over the sea, and the water will come back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their drivers. So Moses held out his hand over the sea and the water. But the Lord threw them into the sea, and the water returned and covered the chariots and the drivers and all of the Egyptian army that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them was left, but the Israelites had walked through the sea on dry ground with the walls of water on both sides. On that day, the Lord saved the people of Israel from the Egyptians, and the Israelites saw them lying dead on the seashore. When the Israelites saw the great power which God had, God, which uh, the Lord God had defeated the Egyptians, they stood in awe of the Lord, and they had faith in the Lord and in His servant Moses. This is the word of God for the people of God. Yesterday, Saturday, was the 20th year anniversary of the September 11th attacks on our country. And I want to ask you if you remember what you were doing on that day, 20 years ago, those of you who are still or were uh, around at that time, what were you doing? Just take a second and think back on that moment. Um, someone had once said to me, everyone knew what they were doing when Moses, or, or when, um, when Elvis died. Everyone knew where they were and what they were doing. And I have to say, I still remember that. I was riding back from Wellsville, Ohio with my sister when we heard it on the radio. 
So what were you doing during 9-11? And do you remember what was happening in your life at the time? I do, very vividly, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I'm fairly confident that most of us could remember it just, just like it was yesterday. I was at work on my job, and I had a job at that time uh, driving a, a big delivery truck for a company out in West Knoxville that had, it was a propane gas company. Uh, and I would fill tanks all around uh, our area here close by, and uh, probably nine counties around us I would travel. And since it was early in September, we hadn't really geared up for our big push to get everyone filled for the fall season. We were doing a little bit of that, but not a whole lot. And uh, when I came uh, in, uh, one of the guys was in the break room watching television, which was not a very common thing for us. We didn't have the television on very often. And it was a live feed from New York, New York City, where the first of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center had been fit, hit by the first plane. And as we were watching um, this unfold and trying to figure out what had happened, uh, some kind of a crazy accident, we thought the other plane, the second plane, flew directly into the other tower. And we knew right away that this was not an accident. And I can remember looking out of the break room door at those three huge propane storage tanks and the two rail cars that were sitting in the yard, more than three quarters of a million of gallons of liquid petroleum gas. And I clocked out and I went home for the day. And they say, for every cloud, there is a silver lining. For every valley, there's a mountain. And for every challenge in life, there is some corny cliche, and I think that's probably true. Um, but believers, we serve a God who is a God of the rescue. Yahweh is a God that rescues his people. And that's what we find in the passage that I read to you today from Exodus. We see the children of Israel backed up against the Red Sea with nowhere to go. The Pharaoh and his army were in pursuit of them. And this pillar of cloud and smoke between them and the Pharaoh's army. And as I said, why was he chasing them? Well, because God had delivered them from captivity in Egypt through all of those uh, plagues that we had heard about. And now apparently Pharaoh was angry and he wanted them back. And if he couldn't get them back, he was going to just wipe them out. So we have Pharaoh on one side and the Red Sea on the other. And we call that being between a rock and a hard place. That's how we describe it. And I want to say to you, that's exactly where God wanted them. Exactly where God wanted them. And so... You know, as we focus on this text this morning, what I want to what I want to use uh, to focus on is a couple of sentences in there. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and His servant Moses. When we look back through our canon of the Bible, we find. A lot of examples that are just like this one, maybe not as powerful as this one. There are events where God's people or God's person, whoever that was, had their back against the wall. Backed up against the wall at the end of their rope between a rock and a hard place with no hope, no way out. And perhaps you know, the saddest word in the English language is hopeless, hopeless, no hope. The Pharaoh on one side and the Red Sea on the other, that's a hopeless place. But right where God wanted them to be. And why is that so often the case for God's people? And I believe it's because God Almighty, 
Uh, that is the place where God Almighty can work the best. That is the place, uh, let me just say it this way, that's the place where the cool stuff happens. Can you say amen to that? And maybe somebody would shout glory to God because that's the truth. When God's people run through every option they have, every option, and they have nowhere to turn, and they have tried to answer their own problems on our own, and we still wind up at the end of our rope, God has finally gotten us where we need to be. At the end of our rope, right where God wants us to be. And God has finally gotten us to the point where we will call out to him and say, God, help me. I have nowhere else to turn. I am at the end of my rope and I don't know what to do. And do you want to know um, what God's word tells us when we get there? Um, just tie a knot in the end of the rope and hang on because help is on the way. That's what God, God's word tells us time and time again. There they were, the Hebrew people, Pharaoh on one side and the Red Sea on the, other way, on the other side, nowhere to go. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the wind began to blow. And it blew all night. The Holy Ghost showed up and the waters parted and God's people went across on dry land. I, 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 that is an amazing thing. What an image to see from God. When we are at the place where there is no way out, then watch out because God is about to move. He is about to do something in a great way. And that's exactly where God wants us because our God is the God of the rescue. So when that happens to us again, when we get into that place at the end, it is time to lift up our eyes unto the hills because help is on the way. Time and time again, God has rescued his people right on time, right on time, every time. Can you say amen to that? Think about the story of Noah and the ark, David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Paul and Silas, and then Jesus Christ himself. The trial, the whipping, the ridicule, the cross, then his last breath, no hope, no hope, there is no hope. Jesus is dead, there's no hope. All hell broke out into cheers because Jesus is dead. Until Jesus reached out his hand and started knocking on hell's door. Sam saying, I am the living one. I died. But guess what? I'm alive forevermore. Amen to that. And by the way, he had the keys of death and of hell itself. The grave was, was where God wanted Jesus Christ to be. The grave was the place where God could work the best the place where there was no hope, a grave, a grave. Because the hopeless place, <laughs> maybe the bird is saying amen, I don't know. The hopeless place is where God works the best. The hopeless place is where the coolest stuff happens. Because it was the Lord's plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He'll enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. That's Isaiah 53, 10. The cross was God's plan and we're still reaping the benefits of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. Imagine that. That was the most powerful event in the history of God's work, the death and resurrection of his only son. God is the God of the rescue, 
and he is still rescuing us today. Praise be to God. Disciples, God has rescued us. We have nothing to fear. Take courage, because God is working. You know, 9-11 was a long time ago. 20 years is forever uh, in our lives. I mean, it's, it's a long period of time. A lot of things happen in 20 years. And you know, we've gone through many things in that 20 year period of time. And I have to say, as I think back on it, challenging times, great times. You know, when there, were, there were many of us clergy persons and Bible scholars who believed that, or were hoping that uh, that, that particular event, 9-11, would bring us out of postmodernism. You know, back to a time where people would once again turn to God in America. And, well, I have to say, just for a period, a short period of time, churches were, uh, church attendance was back up just for a little while after 9-11. But it was really rather short-lived. And there was an interesting thing, and I, I, I thought about it this morning. I had heard that Walmart at that time sold out of two items. Um, and we've been challenged by that most recently with all kinds of items not being there. But Walmart sold out of two items almost immediately after a 9-11, and that was ammunition and Bibles. And the interesting thing about that today is you can't get you can hardly find ammunition at Walmart anymore. And uh, most Walmarts don't even sell Bibles anymore. That's what's changed in 20 years. You know, that, that as I said, that time when churches were filled once again uh, after 9-11 was rather short-lived. And it wasn't long before people settled right back into their complacency and began, well, not attending church rather frequently once again. And, and sadly, we have moved from postmodernism, from postmodernism into what scholars have called post-Christianity. Let that phrase wash over you, post-Christianity, after Christianity. You know, we've had a, another crisis most recently, and that's this, uh, and many more people have died than died in the 9-11 attacks. And this pandemic continues to affect us, and here I am, uh, giving my devotional once again uh, and having virtual church as it were and the the truth is COVID-19 is going to be with us forever and as I thought about this yesterday um, you know this pandemic continues to affect us keeping us out of church keeping us in fear and as I thought about it um, I know very very firmly that COVID-19 is going to be with us forever. It will probably change, and it's even changing now, moving toward a virus that will not affect us as badly as it has been. Uh, not as many people uh, are dying from the effects of it, and it won't kill everyone, but it's something that we're going to suffer with, just like these other COVID-19 COVID, uh, viruses that pass, we pass around from year to year with the common cold. And as I've thought about that, I think, what, what should be our response now as a church? And as I listened to the game on the radio yesterday, and that was another rather sad event, um, Bob Kessling, was, there was a commercial where he, he said, tailgating is back at uh, UT Games. Tailgating is back. In other words, we didn't have it last, no, no tailgating last year because of COVID-19. But tailgating is back. And I thought, tailgating is back. But church is still out. People are traveling and taking their vacations. But church is still out. Restaurants are full. But church is still out. We can go to Dollywood. Uh, we can go to Disney World. We can go to Disneyland or wherever we want to go. But church is still out. And, you know, folks, we really, as I thought about these things, you know, we'd already made the decision not to have church today. And uh, I had sent that announcement out. Saturday morning, and as I went moved through the day, I, I thought about it, and I really believe we need to rethink our response as the church to this whole pandemic thing. It's gonna we're moving from a pandemic to an endemic, where we're gonna have this virus around forever. It's not gonna go away, but thankfully, 
to our uh, vaccinations, which I believe have come from God. Because all good things come from God and all knowledge comes from God. God is all knowledge. He is all science. Omni scientia, all science, all knowledge. And even though it may make us uncomfortable, maybe we've got to change our location. Maybe we've got to go outside. Maybe we've got to meet back in our family life centers again just for a little while. But I have to say, I wonder whether we're doing the right thing by being out of church. Somehow we've got to find a way for the church to stay open. If all these other things can be open, restaurants and entertainment venues and football games and tailgating, maybe we need to move beyond our comfort zone and figure out a way. Swallow our pride just a little bit just to stay in church to stay together as the body of Christ. And in 20 years, things have changed a lot. And sadly for the church, not necessarily for the better. And it's my prayer that the ones who call themselves, us, we, the ones who call themselves the people of God, will one day, as the children of Israel, wake up and see the power of the Lord, and stand in awe of Him, and once again have faith in God Almighty. That's my prayer for us today. Um, I want to say that I love you all, that I care very deeply for our people, and I don't want to put us in harm's way. But I believe God is calling us beyond our fear change the way we think about things and change our mind toward how we gather and find a way to gather no matter what. May God richly bless you all is my prayer that God will call us back to him, call us back to an authentic following of Jesus Christ. And let me send you with a blessing. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace. Now go and serve the Lord. Amen. God bless you all.